24-year-old Annie Lay was born in San Jose, California and grew up in a big family. Described by those that knew her as conscientious, polite and friendly to everyone she met, with a lot of tenacity and a great sense of humour. From a young age, she was known as an exceptional student. She was the valedictorian of her graduating high school class and her classmates voted her the most likely to be the next Einstein. Annie earned $160,000 in scholarships and went on to obtain her undergraduate degree in cell development biology from the University of Rochester. It was here she met Jonathan Widowski. The young couple were inseparable from the get-go. Annie said he was her best friend, and before long, Jonathan asked her to marry him. September 13th, 2009 was set as the big day, and the wedding plans quickly got underway. After all those years of very intense and hard work, Annie was accepted into the prestigious Ivy League school, Yale University, hoping to earn her doctorate in pharmacology. She was always hands-on within her campus, getting involved in various extracurricular activities. She even wrote an article about campus safety, titled Crime and Safety in New Haven for Yale Medical School's B Magazine. Jonathan and Annie were living 76 miles apart at the time. Jonathan was at Columbia University, working on his own doctorate, and this only made their reunion for the wedding on the 13th even more special. September 7th, 2009. Annie was now in her final year at Yale. It was five days until the wedding, and it was safe to say Annie was as busy as ever. She was definitely feeling the stress of everything and called her friend Jennifer for some friendly words of encouragement. Jennifer said Annie asked if she thought they were too young to get married. But knowing this was normal nerves combined with the stress of Yale, Jennifer said she and Jonathan were absolutely making the right decision. Annie thanked her friend for telling her what she needed to hear, hung up and carried on with her day. September 8th, 2009. Annie still had lots of work to do around the campus before she set off to Long Island. She left her apartment that morning and took the Yale Transit to her office, located on campus. She then walked to her lab where she would conduct most of her research, and this was about a minute away, at 10 Amistad Street. Room G13. The day on campus soon drew to a close. Students were leaving to head home and various buildings were locking up. Annie's roommates had been expecting her home hours ago, but she was nowhere to be seen. It got to 9pm and, with no one able to get hold of her, her roommates called the New Haven Police Department and reported her missing. Her friend Jennifer said that Annie always made sure she was safe. She didn't walk around at night by herself, and if she ever had to work late, she would make sure someone would come and pick her up, or walk home with her. So the fact that no one had received a call from her that day was very concerning. Police went to Annie's office, where they found her wallet, keys, purse, and phone. But there were no signs of a struggle inside. Her belongings still being in there indicated she had likely left that morning, with the intention of returning to her office fairly soon after. None of her credit or debit cards had been used, and her phone had no activity on it since she left it in the office. Her Yale ID card seemed to be the only thing from her purse that went with her that morning, and it had been used to get into the labs. CCTV confirmed it was Annie using her own ID card, and the footage captured her walking into 10 Amistad Street, at around 10am. She was carrying something that can't really be made out, but it's assumed it was something to do with her research. Although CCTV can't always convey a full story, it didn't look like anything was wrong with Annie that morning. She wasn't running away from anyone, she didn't seem to be in a rush, 
and no one stopped to talk to her on the way in. By all accounts, it seemed like a very typical morning for her. Unfortunately, there was only one camera on the basement level where Annie's lab was located, and it didn't show her walking past or through the door at all. At 12.50pm that day, a fire alarm sounded in the building, and everyone was evacuated. One of the lab technicians assigned to maintain room G13 was a man named Ray, and he came forward with information. He didn't attend Yale, but had worked there for a little while. He told authorities that he had clocked in at 7am, and had seen Annie in G13. He then said he thought he had seen her leave the lab just before the fire alarm went off that afternoon. The footage continued to be looked at, and authorities went into the building to see if they could see anything. Every hallway, room, cupboard, and outside bin were searched. but nothing was there. Although Ray said he remembered her leaving, they couldn't see anything on the 70 cameras around the area that confirmed this. Yale offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to Annie's whereabouts. Her fiancé flew in from New York, and her family travelled over from California to help with the search. Annie's odd disappearance quickly became big news. Reporters were all over the campus, and over 100 law enforcement officers joined the search too. Authorities weren't initially sure if they were dealing with an abduction, or something even more sinister, but some believed Annie had maybe got cold feet about her wedding and run away. This was quickly refuted by her friends and family, however. Annie had been planning the wedding for over a year, and hadn't ever shown any signs of changing her mind about it. One of her friends said she was doing weather patterns to make sure the weather would be perfect on her wedding day. She wanted everything to be perfect, everything down to the table napkins, to flowers. Annie was very, very excited about this day. Her disappearance just days before the wedding made no sense. With still nothing from Annie, a second search of the building was conducted. And this time, a closer look at room G13 uncovered a drop of blood on one of the shelving units. And, in a back storage room, G22, some beads that were determined to have been part of Annie's necklace were also found on the floor. On September 12th, after finding the blood, Police started a more in-depth search of G13. Lifting up one of the ceiling tiles, they found a bloody sock and a single blue surgical glove. They then brought in luminol, which was used across the neighbouring labs, including G22. More blood was found in there. There was also a distinctly terrible smell developing around the locker rooms and toilets near to G22, a smell that some of the officers knew all too well. Cadaver dogs were brought in to try and locate the source of it, and the whole building was declared a crime scene. In the heart of New Haven, Yale is one of the city's oldest institutions and one of the largest, with more than 20,000 students, faculty and staff, and its own police force. But the mysterious and troubling disappearance of doctoral student Annie Lee, with intensive media coverage of the investigation, is most unwelcome publicity. In a series of emails, university officials urge the Yale community not to speak to reporters who can be very aggressive in situations like this, where there are more questions than answers. Instead of us thinking of an Ivy League institution and an excellent education, we're thinking about crime and safety. 
Four days after Lee's disappearance, the university's police chief sought to reassure the Yale community. The concern reaches far beyond the New Haven campus. His parents are like calling in, like checking, you know, are you safe? Today, authorities continue to work in the laboratory where Annie Lee was last seen. Authorities reportedly have discovered bloody clothing in the ceiling of the building. Published reports say the clothing is not Lee's. Investigators are also pouring through garbage at a Hartford waste facility looking for clues. The FBI continues to head up the investigation numbering some 100 law enforcement authorities from Yale, the city of New Haven, and the state of Connecticut in an all-out effort to find Annie Lee. A day later, 5 p.m., on September 13, 2009, Annie Lee's decomposing body was found, stuffed upside down, inside a wall behind a metal utility panel in the basement of the building, near the lockers and room of G22. September 13th was the day that Annie should have been walking down the aisle, and it was a tragic end to the five-day search. The state medical examiner determined that Annie had died from traumatic asphyxiation by neck compression. She had a broken jaw and broken collarbone, and these injuries happened to her when she was alive. Further examination showed evidence of a sexual assault. Near to her body was her key card and a blue surgical glove that paired with the one found under the ceiling tile. DNA samples were taken from her clothes and the area around her body and sent off to see if there was a hit on the combined DNA index system, CODIS. A vigil was held for Annie on campus and the loss of one of their own hung heavily over the staff and students. The school made grief counsellors available for everyone, as well as a 24-hour helpline to anyone that needed it. Because of the access codes and IDs that people needed to get around the campus, Officer Joe Avery said they were not investigating this as a random act, instead believing it to be an inside job. He also said they didn't believe that any of the students were involved, and no one else was in any danger. This was reiterated by Robert Alpern, Dean of the Yale School of Medicine. He said, I think that it suggests it was someone who could get into that space. It certainly would be extremely difficult for someone outside of Yale to get into that space. Not impossible, but extremely difficult. This only added to the foreboding feeling hanging over the already frightened campus. Students were scared about moving from class to class. Some said they were now travelling in big groups, even during the middle of the day. Others were turning down shifts at work around the university for fear that whoever had done this was likely still walking around the campus too. It wasn't long before a hit came back on the DNA. A match came back to a convicted felon named Kieran Robinson. This was not actually the clear-cut answer the police had been looking for. It was soon confirmed that Kieran had been shot and killed a long time before anything in Annie's case had ever happened. And his DNA being near her body could be easily explained. Kieran had actually been one of the people that helped with some construction on that particular building in the years before he died. And with no other matches on the CODIS database, police were still searching. More days would pass, and by this point, detectives had reviewed about 700 hours of video and interviewed over 150 people. There was one more person that had been on the detectives' radar since the start, but they didn't quite have enough to prove anything just yet. Using the keycard data, it was confirmed that only two other people had swiped into room G13 that day. One was a third-party contractor that was ruled out very quickly. and the other was 24-year-old Raymond Clark, the lab technician that told police he had seen Annie leaving the building that day. Little did Ray know, this one claim to police had put him straight in their eyeline, as the cameras had already confirmed she absolutely did not leave. He had a reputation of being controlling and often quite nasty to any students that left the lab dirty. Ray had in fact emailed Annie to complain about her leaving dirty mice cages behind after one of her studies. 
That being said, Yale had no record of disciplinary action taken against him at any point. Others, however, said Ray was pleasant and personable. Between 10.40am that morning, until around 3.45pm, Ray had gone in and out of G13 and G22, a total of 55 times. And this was confirmed using his keycard and the cameras. They also captured Ray leaving when the fire alarm went off that afternoon, and coming back in at 10 past 1. He walked around the basement area wearing slightly different scrubs, before clocking off just before 4pm. At one point during the day, Ray went out onto the streets and sat down on the steps with his head in his hands. When police spoke to him, they noticed scratches on his face and arm, along with some fairly fresh bruises. He said the scratches came from a cat. He was asked to come in for a polygraph test, which shows signs of deception, but as always, a polygraph test is not admissible, and this wasn't enough for them to hold him. They asked him to submit a DNA sample before he left, which he did, and with this, he was let go while they awaited the results. New Haven police have made an arrest in the killing of a Yale University graduate student, Annie Lay. Before the sun came up this morning, unmarked cars had surrounded this Motel 8 in Cromwell, Connecticut. FBI agents, local police, all gathered here, waiting for word from New Haven's police chief. They knew the arrest warrant was coming for 24-year-old Raymond Clark III. The lab technician who worked in the same building where Yale grad student Annie Lay did her research. He was inside a motel room here with his father. <laughs> Authorities got the green light shortly after 8 this morning. Immediately, barricades went up on the highway in front of the motel, and a team of FBI agents raced up the back stairs straight to room 214. <laughs> There they found Raymond Clark in a white shirt, tan pants, and soon he was wearing handcuffs. Hidden behind tinted windows, he was brought into the New Haven Police Department. Hey, big man. Enjoy jail. And then, just two hours after Clark's arrest... All right, this is number 15, Raymond Clark. Uh, he was arraigned in court in the murder of Annie Lay. ABC News has learned authorities have been closely following Clark for days, first quietly following him, then the surveillance soon became more overt, as Clark quickly became the primary person of interest. They need something to link. Renowned this forensics expert Dr. Henry Lee served as state police commissioner in Connecticut. Now he runs his own forensic center at the University of New Haven. He helped advise the forensics team working this case in recent days and says those access cards have provided a timeline inside that lab building on the last day Annie Lay was seen alive, revealing any opportunities a suspect would have had to harm Annie Lay. What could those white cards tell us? They tell us they have a means and opportunity. These two are going to be together. And there are reports of the cards, the swipe cards, put them both in that room, sure. the last room where she was. That's become a very crucial information. And there was one more thing police were waiting for, the DNA. Last night, with Raymond Clark clearly the prime suspect and yet still a free man, the New Haven police chief said it would take just one thing. If we have one match on a person that we know was at that location, we will be going for an arrest warrant. And then this morning, Dr. Lee learned of the arrest. When you heard of that arrest this morning, yes. did that say to you right away there must have been a DNA match? Yes, I know DNA had a match. And uh, of course, it's a relief. Tonight, Raymond Clark has been moved to a maximum security prison in Suffield, Connecticut. And New Haven's police chief continues to believe there was only one killer in this case. The chief said today that Annie Lay and Raymond Clark never had any kind of romantic relationship. Today, the family of Annie Lay's fiancé, the man she was supposed to have married last weekend, released a statement saying we want to thank all of those who were involved in preparations for a wedding that was not to be, for their quiet understanding. A total of four search warrants and the results of the DNA test had finally confirmed that he was Annie's killer. The bloody sock found in the wall and the lab coat Ray was wearing contained both sets of DNA. Ray had signed into the building that day with a green pen. A green pen was found under Annie's body with both hers and Ray's DNA on it. This, along with the keycard data and camera footage, 
cemented everything. They believe Annie was killed just before the fire alarm went off. Ray quickly changed his scrubs which had blood on them and left Annie in the lab before heading out when the alarm went off, before hurrying back in, moving her body through G22 and then forcing her behind the panel. Investigators say they have more than enough physical evidence to convict Clark and may not even need to establish a motive. You know, the only person that really truly knows the motive in this crime is the suspect. What made him do what he did? And we may not know till trial or we may never know. Today's New York Post reports Lay's body was so mangled with broken bones it wasn't recognizable and that Raymond Clark may have accidentally tripped a fire alarm with his or Lay's security swipe card. Clark's attorney, Joseph Lopez, plans to file a complaint over what he claims are excessive leaks from police to the media. As Annie Lay's family prepares for their final goodbyes, Pastor Dennis Smith asked for prayers for two families in need. Who knows what happened exactly? If he is the individual that did it, uh, he certainly needs our prayers um, and his family needs our prayers. All police could find that might have pointed to some sort of motive was an email. On the day Annie was killed, she sent out a mass email to the whole building saying that she was getting married on the 13th and would be away for a few days on her honeymoon. Ray had opened this email. Ray was engaged to be married too and police could only speculate on this, but they wondered if Ray had had a secret obsession with Annie for a while, and reading this email spiralled into a fit of jealousy and rage. He was held on a three million dollar bond, and his lawyer told people he was expected to plead not guilty. Annie would soon be laid to rest, and her funeral was broadcast live online. Her mother, Vivian, made an emotional speech. John, even now, Annie is gone, but I still have you and love you very much, like my son, Christopher. I think that I speak on behalf of all of us gathered here when I say that I will never fully understand why this has happened or why it happened to my sister. But since those questions are beyond our understanding, I think it is best to consign ourselves to the will of God and put faith in providence. Over the past few weeks, I have been reflecting on the role of my sister in my life, and only now do I realize how important she was to me. Annie was always the same little girl that has and will always be in our hearts and in our prayers. G2, I miss you, and I will always love you. Jonathan also wore the wedding ring Annie should have given him. Despite initially pleading not guilty, Ray Clark soon changed his plea. He pleaded guilty to murder in exchange for a 44-year sentence. He was also found guilty of attempting to commit a sexual assault. The sexual assault plea was entered under Connecticut's Alford Doctrine, which means the defendant doesn't agree to the facts, but acknowledges that the state has enough evidence to gain a conviction. Ray Clark is scheduled for release in 2053. He will be almost 70 years old. Ray's father, Raymond Clark Jr., said, It is with a heavy heart that I stand here before you today. We will live out our life knowing that he is behind bars, but we are proud of Ray for taking responsibility for his actions and pleading guilty. I want you to know that Ray has expressed extreme remorse from the very beginning. I can't tell you how many times he has sobbed uncontrollably, telling me how sorry he is, telling me how his heart is tortured by the reality that he caused the death of Annie. Annie's mother did not attend the sentencing because it was too painful, but she said her family were happy with the result. Although Annie's killer was caught and convicted, the real reason behind her death remains a total mystery, as Ray has never said or explained why. A Yale spokesman, Michael Moran, said, As the criminal proceedings come to a close, we renew our commitment to honour the memory of Annie Lay, whose joy of life and learning is an inspiration to faculty, students and staff at Yale, now and for the future. Annie had a bright future ahead of her in so many ways, just days away from marrying her best friend, 
and soon to complete a doctorate she had worked so very hard for. Annie's friend Natalie said she was as good a human being as you'd ever hope to meet.